No, it's because we ate too long. All righty. This is uh, IFAST UQ&A with Bill Hartman. Uh, today, we have a lot of our dedicated fan base here. Um, rules, which I think most of you guys know, except for Rufus. Um, if you're not <laughs> talking, <laughs> mute the mic. <laughs> Did you just give me the finger? No, that's that. <laughs> that's the finger. Oh, baby. Okay. Uh, this, first and foremost, uh, Alex and Steven. Well, Alex, do you have any questions for Bill yet? Uh, yeah, actually. So, hey, Bill. Hey, how are you? Good to meet you. Um, so, as you can hear from my accent, I'm Canadian. And uh, so I, I have no Toronto. idea. Yeah. <laughs> where, where are you in Canada? Toronto. Oh, okay. I got people in Toronto. Yeah. Yeah. What do you know in Toronto? Uh, Russ and um, um, Christine Bloomer, Brian Chung. Um, is, 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 um, is Nichols still up there? Greg Nichols? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know Greg. Oh, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. So my question relates more to hockey. I don't know if you've worked with a lot of hockey players, but... Uh, a, a couple. Not, not many, but a couple. Yeah. Yeah. One of the common things is obviously... Uh, anterior hip impingement yep um so i was wondering if you could kind of speak about that Just, okay. i don't know if that's too broad of a question or <clears throat> what position uh defense okay because it's different with it's different with goalies than it is with yeah. with, uh, with with skaters uh yeah. the other skaters um yeah. because the goalies tend to be more um bilateral Right, and then the uh, the like like your wingers are definitely unis because mm -hmm. they're always on the outside skate. Okay, and so they 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 either have to blow out a hip or they have to turn into a hip. So so it it's really not a whole lot of different, um, be, because they're either going to be a unilateral or bilateral extended um, type of a guy, um, and and so. As always, your tests are going to sort of drive your decision making. So a lot of these guys, they're not going to have a lot of internal rotation, but they can lack internal rotation on either side for different reasons. Some guys are already there, and some guys can't go there. And so that's what you have to figure out more than anything else: is is what are you looking at um, in that regard? So so to give you a little little bit of a of an algorithm. So if um, if you don't have internal rotation of the hip, so they, they'll and it'll, and it'll be painful, obviously, and 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 so your impingement test will be positive or whatever. If you don't have internal rotation, and you lack abduction on the same side, then they're already internally rotated, and you have to externally rotate them. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, makes sense. So, 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 yeah. So they, so these are the people that will test like weak and and hip abduction. They'll test weak in like a glute max type of a thing, mm -hmm. okay? Because they're already turned inward, mm -hmm. and that's why they don't have internal rotation. So, a, a common error that people make is to try to stretch them further into internal rotation, without considering where the the hip joint actually is in space first. Does that make sense? Yeah, and is that so? Is the IR bilateral or would it be into so like let's say you're lefty shooting right so would that make it um the left leg would be more ir or would it just be it's possible it's entirely possible right that, that you're going to see that and again this is this is a matter of putting some steps together mm -hmm. right um and and so one test does not give you the information so uh, just a lack of hip internal rotation does not mean that that they're incapable of internally rotating they may already be there and that's why i say if you look in combinations of, of tests the, the lack of internal rotation plus the lack of abduction they're already there so to try to force them there is a bad idea the way you restore the internal rotation is to reposition the the pelvis in the sagittal plane and then um inhibit the uh the abduction and you'll and and then restore the the hip external rotation, and and that usually brings it right back. So like I said, it it all depends on 
on what you're looking at, but you have to look at things in combination. And I think that's the biggest mistake that people make. They weight one test too heavily. And then the next thing you know, it's like they say, oh, you've got a hip flexor strain when you're, you're just driving them harder and harder into impingement and, and their hip flexor is getting potentially irritated um, from, from the position that you're using or it's not a hip flexor in the first place, right? So it's, it's just a matter of combining the tests. And, and again, that's where people have always made the mistake. Is that cool? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yes. Yeah. That it? Time to go to bed? Yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> All right, guys. Good night. Kidding. So, somebody else want to step up to the plate? Go ahead, Stephen. I'm waiting. <laughs> hey, um, I'm trying to get my girl from Columbus to come see you. Oh, cool. I think you that's met her. Awesome. Over at Kozak's place? Uh, I don't know. I can't, uh, I can't say who she is on, in public, so obviously. Yeah, I know. There, there's only one woman that I've met there so far, and I don't recall her seeing okay. her. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, anyway, um, I'm, I'm trying to cut the apron strings a little bit, and um, I said if she, runs in, I, if she runs in any trouble between now and then, I want her to see you, okay? Thank you. I, I appreciate You're that. You're welcome. Um, Go ahead. I knew you had one. Yeah, I'm, uh, I guess still in regards to treating patients with thoracic kyphosis or, you know, excessive thoracic kyphosis. Mm -hmm. When you see that walk through the doors, I guess, like, what's your initial thought process? What are some initial exercises that you're going what are you, to? What are your, okay, so uh, is, this, is this the people that are, that are kyphotic that can't touch their toes and they can't reach overhead? Yeah, yes. Okay, yes. so you got lats that are going crazy. Mm -hmm. Okay. You've got uh, rectus abdominis that's going crazy. And you probably got pecs that are going crazy, right? All at the same time. Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. So that means they're, that, that they're extended up to the point of the kyphosis. Okay. Okay. That means that the, the pressure in the upper thorax is higher than it is in the lower thorax. Okay. That's why their sternum's vertical. There's too much pressure in the upper upper thorax, right? So they, they have to pooch out their belly and then they can't use their obliques and transversus and then they have to use rectus as the, um, the unfortunate um, final abdominal available to them as an exhaler. They'll yank down on their sternum. They pull themselves into a kyphosis. The kyphosis is also there to try to get them some element of diaphragm dissension. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the way you got to go after these guys is I got to get air into the upper part of the thorax. Okay. Okay. I have to get a sternum that can pump handle. Mm -hmm. That means you get you got to get a pelvis underneath them. You got to teach them how to exhale, and then you got to teach them how to inhale while pulling up on the upper rib cage. Okay. So think pec minor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if you can if you can get a pelvis underneath them, you can take advantage of their love for their lats because the lats will pull up on the lower rib cage and actually expand that area for you. When you say that the pressure in the thorax is, is greater than uh, or the, the mm -hmm. pressure in the thorax is greater, is that because uh, they get there through hyperinflation and then just jam the sternum down? So sit up away from your chair for a second, young man. Okay, make your spine relatively tall. Mm -hmm. And then I want you to pull your sternum straight down and in towards you. So, you have, so you're gonna pull yourself into your kyphosis, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, without moving that, so don't allow your sternum to move. Try to take a breath in and tell me where the air pressure goes. It goes down and forward. Do you feel it? Uh, a little bit, I guess. Okay, let your sternum come up and take a breath. Oh, that's different. So that's not them. 
Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so they're trying to get a diaphragm in a position that they can use to breathe because it's sort of like the last ditch effort that's mm -hmm. available to them. But in doing so, you have to create more pressure in the upper thorax. And so the air has to go into the lower thorax. It goes lower anterior because that's the path of least resistance. Their mm -hmm. belly has to give way. Okay. okay. And, and so that's what you're looking at. And so you have to be able to get air into the upper thorax. So that's an arms overhead scenario, mm -hmm. or it's a manual therapy scenario, right? So these people respond really well if you can if you can do some manual stuff where you can provide a manual resistance to the lower rib cage, mm -hmm. a manual assist into shoulder flexion. So you're actually helping them reach overhead. Okay. And then you're you're lower hand on the rib cage becomes the exhale hand and the rib the or the hand on the on the arm that's helping them flex yeah your inhale hand does okay. that picture it yeah so you'd be almost like distracting the upper extremity overhead who's the smartest guy in the room there you go that's it yep. um in regards to exercise prescription i assume that you know like the like a kettlebell pullover or something like that might, you might not want to do that because the lats are so active already, or is that? So, so this depends on where you got the pelvis, because if you can get a pelvis underneath them, like I said, you can actually use the lats to your advantage because the lats attach on the lower part of the rib cage, right? So it was it yeah. uh, seventh rib on down, right? Is that correct? Let me check somewhere, that. Somewhere around there. Rib, right. So, um, if you can get a pelvis underneath them, you can actually use the lats to your advantage to actually open up that lower part, right? Because it'll be an it'll be an inhibitory stimulus to the to the lower uh, uh, the lower part of the spine that's extended. The the lats, as long as they're working on a on a neutral pelvis. I didn't say neutral. I never said neutral. I said you got to get a pelvis underneath them. Okay. okay? There's a difference. There's a difference. So what you need to do is move the attachment of the lats further away from the shoulder, okay, mm -hmm. in a non-extended spine. Then you have, an, they have a mechanical advantage where the lats will actually pull up on the rib cage. I get you. So, so you know the serratus posterior inferiors and your, your, your iliocostalis mm -hmm. that they reach up and grab the lower part of the ribs? Well, when you're in extended position, they keep that, that area closed and extended. If mm -hmm. I can reverse the pelvis and I can bring the lats around, so this way, if, if I'm facing this way, my lat mm -hmm. comes around this way, it'll catch the lower part of the ribcage and pull up. Well, that pulls up and out, and now I can actually expand that. So if you've ever done a, a bar hang with somebody and stood in, in, in the, the sagittal view, and you see that big posterior medial steinum expansion, mm -hmm. Yeah, lats helping you with that. Okay. So it like what you're saying is actually pulling the lower part of the posterior rib cage open because exactly. they're hanging from, from their arms essentially. Exactly right. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um that helps a lot. In, in regards to prognosis, I'm sure this is all over depending on the patient, but um uh, I guess that's probably not even a good question, but the last thing you're going to get back mm -hmm. will be the upper thoracic rotation. Yeah. So don't even worry about it. It's the last thing that's going to come back. Because any, any, any measure that you utilize to determine whether they've got that rotation is probably going to be um, due to laxity because they will blow out the front of their shoulder um, that's kind of how they, they create rotation is they have to create laxity. And so that laxity is going to, going to, um, alter your upper extremity tests. Okay. okay. And the, the, the scapula in that patient with thoracic kyphosis is going to be super anteriorly tipped because of the kyphosis that they have. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. In most cases. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. That helps a okay. lot. Good. Cool, Stephen. Thank you.
Um, Mitchell, do you have anything? Welcome back. This is Bill. Have you said hi to Bill yet? Can't hear you. You're muted. There we go. All good now. <laughs> How's it going? I was just waiting for a little break so I could introduce myself. How's it going? Good. Where are you? Uh, I am in California. I go to, uh, I don't go there. I intern with Patrick at Cal State Fullerton right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So cool. Good for you. Thank you. Do you have any um, uh, questions for the, the PT guy over here? I do have a question. Sure. So bring it um, on. I guess it, so I'm wondering, Patrick and I are both talking about this, um, about like coming up with an assessment for um, any individual or like the assessment process that you use. Is that mainly based on like uh, stuff that you just like, I don't know, let me try and figure out how to uh, question this. I know it's probably a really based on PRI. Am I correct on that? No? Okay. Go yeah. ahead. Ask me anything you want. <laughs> Do I know just, what to test? Uh, what is that? Do you want to know what to test? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just uh, Okay. Sorry. Sure. Um, so, so can I tell you a story and answer your question at the same time? would love to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a great story. <laughs> it's a great story. Um, and Lance, did you do the old assessment? Did you ever do any of those? Oh yeah. 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 That was okay. how you originally taught me. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we used to do 77 different tests. <laughs> this is no lie, right? 77. And, um, I got good enough. I could knock them out in about 25 minutes. And, uh, one of the reasons that, it, that I did that is because I wasn't sure what was important or not. And, now I have a foundational assessment that's down to 12 tests. Okay. And, and if, if, and I'm, I'm, I, I can start treating with one. Okay. And it's not the one you think. Um, but I can start treating with one test if I had to, I don't want to, but if I had to, I could do it. Um, and the, the thing that I would say, because it's going to depend on your population, there is no such thing as one assessment that works on everybody because everybody's yeah. going to present with, with some of their own uh, idiosyncrasies and things that become more meaningful. So I'll, I'll offer you this. Like the standard part of my assessment, I don't look at, at toes, right? Like I'll look at them when they're standing up or whatever, but I don't measure anything with toes. I don't go there until I need to because I think mm -hmm. there's other stuff that's way more important towards the center of the body that I think that you have to resolve first. And so I think that that's, that's your determining factor is like, okay, what's important for your population? So if I saw more runners, I'd probably spend more time on feet right away, but I don't. Um, and it, some of it is like a time saving issue. Um, but for me to say that you got to measure this, you got to measure this, you got to measure this. I don't think it's fair because I just don't think that there's, there's one. Right. And like I said, I've got, I've got some standard tests that I'll default to and they're just extremity tests. Right. Okay. So your typical, you know, hip rotations, shoulder rotations, flexions, extensions, and those are the standards. Right. So I'm just measuring planes of motion in the extremities. And from there you discern essentially what position the, the thorax, the spine, and the pelvis are in, and that gives you the orientation of the sockets, and then that tells you whether your motion is legit or not, or whether it's compensatory mo uh, adaptive motion, mm -hmm. and then you kind of go from there. But like I said, you know, it, it, you know if I, um, who, who do you work with mostly? Do you, do you have like a, a group of athletes? Uh, I would mainly say baseball and basketball are the two that we okay around the okay most. so so one of the so your all of your sagittal plane tests become infinitely more important for your really tall guys mm -hmm. because they're gonna propel themselves in the sagittal plane even though it looks like it's a side to side sport and all that stuff they, their primary plane of propulsion is in the sagittal plane their compensatory planes are frontal and transverse right. So they're going to default into the sagittal plane a lot. So when we talk about restoring motion to those guys, your, your 
full body sagittal plane complex movements like toe touches and squats and stuff like that are going to be really big time money tests for you mm -hmm. because complex movements are comparators, all right? They're not decision makers. But if you want to know whether you are effective with an intervention, use your sagittal plane test because if the, you know, you'll, you'll see guys that, you know, they can do amazing things and then you ask them to lay on the table and you check shoulder flexion and they're 30 degrees off the table and you're like, how do you get your arms overhead so high? Right. Yeah. And, and so that's why that test becomes important to you because now you know whether they've, they they've got actual um, access to that motion in the sagittal plane or whether they're using compensations to get their hands overhead. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a big deal when you're dealing with these really tall guys that end up with like back pain and hip problems and stuff like that. So, so I love the, the complex movements in the sagittal plane as comparators. Okay. So like I said, your toe touching, your squat, and your overhead reaches and stuff like that. And so those are quick, right? Mm -hmm. You do like, you know, three of those. And then maybe you break it down into, okay, do they have hip extension? Do they have shoulder flexion, et cetera, et cetera. And then you kind of just go from there. And so you sort of evolve your own algorithm based on your population because like I said, there's, there's no guarantee, um, you know, that, that all those tests that, that you do are, are necessary, you know, at that time when you've got some big money tests that are limited, mm -hmm. right. On a regular basis, you just got to recognize like, okay, what's, what's the, what's the limiting factor here? Why, why is it limited? Are they jammed in the sagittal plane? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Because the further they go into the sagittal plane, the less frontal plane and transverse plane they have, which means that they are going to compensate at some point in time. And you want to make sure that they have compensatory motion available to them so they can protect themselves. Okay. The minute you don't have compensatory motion at a joint, now you're going to load the joint. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. Okay? Gotcha. Does that help you at all? Yes. Yeah. That helps a lot because yeah. I found myself, um, I got, and it's a little older, but it's the uh, Assess and Correct book that Eric Cressy What are you had. saying? What are you saying? It's too old? <laughs> it's <laughs> it's just kidding. got a couple of years ago. And well, you're a young and dude, that, that is an old text. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, just flipping through that and then found a whole bunch of sustenance and obviously I wasn't going to do every single one for an athlete, but I just kind of like would yeah. go through, I kind of like picked in a type of athlete for me, like in my head and then just kind of wrote one down. I think I had a list of maybe like 30 assessments and, and I was just looking back and like, there's no way that like for time reasons that. No. And, and, and like I said, I don't, th I don't think you need to. Um, and, and again, we don't do 77 tests anymore, but, yeah. but we did them early on and, and it allowed us to identify a lot of these, these common patterns that we see in people. Um, because, you know, coming from a, a clinical atmosphere where I didn't do that, mm -hmm. Um, cause I was so short on time where I, with, with, when we first opened up the gym, I was unlimited in time. And so I could do anything that I wanted and, and it helped a lot to allow us to narrow things down quite a bit. Um, you know, and then, then you pick up a resource here, you pick up a resource there and then you see, Oh, this is kind of important. This is kind of important. And what you should notice over time is that your tests become fewer and fewer because one test is more dependent on another. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, just like we we're talking about with the hockey example, there'll be some tests that really work well together to give you some ideas as to where things are. Right. Yeah. And, and, uh, um, you'll find that you'll use fewer and fewer over time when you go like, Oh, that one really didn't matter. I didn't do anything about it. That's going to yeah. be like, you're, you're sort of like the, when you start to take things out of your assessment mm -hmm. is like you measure it and you go, but I'm not doing anything about it. So that's yeah. not important anymore, um, at least until it shows up again in some other you know, way, shape, or form. Like I've already eliminated all my big stuff, and I got little stuff hanging on, and then maybe I go back to it and I say, oh, remember this little thing where you had the ankle thingy that didn't go where I wanted it to go? Now i got to kind of figure that one out. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'll just take some time to figure it out. Well, you know, and, and, and it does. I mean, there's, there's, just, not, there's just not absolutes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that um, 
you know, like a star excursion test and stuff like that. For If you're working with basketball players, mm -hmm. that gives you a, a fine bit of information in regards to ankles and such. So, you know, is that something you guys do? Um, no, they don't really do assessments, which kind of is unfortunate, I think. Mm -hmm. um, they did – well, the, the coach who works with them, it, he did like an – did he do an FMS? I don't know. He might have done an FMS test with them, but – that was kind of the extent of so, it. So you're working with a bunch of athletes all at once, right? Yeah. So, so you know what I would do in that scenario? I would train them mm -hmm. until I see something that I don't like. And then I would try to, try to narrow it down that way. Because a lot of times you can just do that because training is testing, right? Yeah. yeah. Right? You, I mean, you see stuff all the time. Definitely. So when you work with a group like that, I don't think you need to do an individualized assessment until it's time to do that. Okay. And, and so just train them. Okay. Right? And, and, just watch and them. your well, your progressions and regressions are the same thing you would do anyway. Yeah. Right. So I see a guy with a goofball squat, and I don't like it. Okay. How about a front squat? Okay, still ugly. How about a goblet squat? Oh, I like that. Do that, and mm -hmm. then you can reverse gears, and then you can progress. Right. So yeah. what do you just do? You just assess them. Yeah. Just, yeah. Right. So don't worry about it until you have to. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you got to break stuff down, then then break stuff down. But until then, don't worry about it. It's not important. Okay. 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 That actually answers my follow-up question, which was going to be, how would you set up like an assessment for team sports, like a team yeah. setting? So I knew that. That's why I went there. <laughs> <laughs> One step ahead of the game. I'm kidding. <laughs> so wait, wait. So you have assessing correct. So, so, yeah. so I think Lance was still our mascot at that point. <laughs> Were you an official employee? Uh, I was I was at least an employee of Assess and Correct. I think okay. I got a, well, a, a beach, steak baby. dinner for that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was cheap. really nice steak, though. Yeah. <laughs> now we have to pay him to get him to do anything. Jeez. <laughs> All right. Mitchell, do you feel like you have some directives that you can take and you can use now? Definitely, yes. That was are, very informative. Are you just saying that because we're in public? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It, okay, okay, good. I just want to make sure. If, it, if that's not enough, then ask me another question. Seriously. I, I'm, I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. But, but it, to, to reiterate, it's like train them. And then yeah. if you see something, then you alter the exercise, right? Mm -hmm. you, you unbalance the load. You change the position of the load. You alter the exercise. You give a different cue, right? You coach them. Mm -hmm. And then if that doesn't work, then you might have to like to throw them on a table and actually measure something. Okay. Right. But until then, don't worry about it. So you wouldn't give them like a corrective until later? I don't believe in correctives, young man. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. Lesson learned. What, 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 what do you mean by that? I guess. Um, what, like are we correcting? The... what are we correcting? Tell me what we're correcting. I guess just give me an example. Just give me like something so you like, did. Um, so Val gets stress on the knee with a squat. Uh huh. Just did you tell him not to do it first. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Did that work? No. Okay. So that, but that was a good experiment, right? So, mm -hmm. so maybe they don't understand what, what you need to do. So what's your next, what's your next order of business? What are you going to do next? Uh, put a band around their knees. Awesome. Did that work? Uh, it was a little better, but still. Okay. Okay. So then what'd you do? Uh, added a heel ramp underneath just to, I don't know, help them get down and help relieve tension off their ankles. And I don't know. It helped that. I feel like helped them the most. Okay. You want to know why? Uh, yes, please. Okay. So here's, this is really cool. So this is something that, that I, I don't know if anybody, I've talked about it in public a couple of times, but I don't know if anybody else has. And, and again, I just don't pay attention enough and I'm sure it's not novel in any way, shape or form. I did not come up with it myself. But if you look at the literature in regards to like when, when you just see the landings with knee valgus and you see squats with knee valgus, mm -hmm. the valgus occurs when you run out of dorsiflexion. Okay. Okay. So what that means, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a bony limitation in dorsiflexion. It might mean that you've got a really strong plantar flexor activity that is actually limiting dorsiflexion. And then the knees drop in, right? Mm -hmm. So changing the position of the center of gravity. So, so here's what you did. You elevated the center of gravity. And so you threw them forward. So they had to compensate by shifting back. 
Now they can sit down into a squat. How cool is that? So is that a good move? It might be a very good move. And then if you want them to squat flat footed, eventually you just slowly lower the, the amount of elevation, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So there you go. What do we call that? We call that graded exposure, right? Or graded yeah. exercise. So you just slowly alter the exercise over time. And guess what? Now you got a pretty squat like you wanted it in the first place. And so that's mm -hmm. just good coaching, right? Yeah. So right. I like what you did. So you did, I mean, you did, you assessed the situation. You, you implemented safe strategies to try to change it. Nothing bad happened. And you ended up with something that you kind of like, right? Mm -hmm. So then you rock. There you go. <laughs> Problem solved. Yeah. That's exactly what you do. That's yeah. how you, yeah. This is how it works, man. It's like you just don't know what the answers are going to be until you see what the answer is, mm -hmm. right? And so then you just, you just apply a strategy. Welcome to the scientific method, right? Trial yeah. and error is exceptionally scientific. Science is a school of thought. It's a way to think, right? It's not mm -hmm. a journal article. Okay? You did yeah. great. You did great. Thank you. You can come, you can come work for me anytime. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to take you up on that. Well, there you go. Well, I might have an opener. All right. I like the sound of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to fire somebody, but you know, <laughs> that's why we fired Tony. <laughs> Had enough of him. Tony. Hey, Tony. <laughs> I can't see you frown when you got the, uh, the fake beard on. Yeah, I, keep it, I keep the beard so you can't see the tears going down my face, Bill. <laughs> Speaking of tears or something. <laughs> <laughs>
And, but I don't know if it's ever done with basketball players because you do see some pretty extremely looking strange feet, right? Yeah. Um, the, the question then becomes, is it a foot problem or is, it, is this an adaptation associated with what is above the foot, right? In a, in a perfect world, you want a foot that's, that's reasonably adaptable, right? But I would also offer that what if it's, this is a strategy that makes them great? And I always ask that question. It's like whenever you measure something, you go, oh, this is bad, right? I don't see stuff as bad anymore. I just see it as what is. And then you sort of have to get to know these people and decide like, okay, this is a problem or this is not a problem. You know, if you got a guy with a really rigid foot, um, with the, you know, the extreme high arch, limited dorsiflexion kind of a guy, and he's got these recurrent strain associated problems, you can't immediately jump and say, oh, it's a foot thing, it's an ankle thing. It's like you have to say, is there any other influences that, are in, that, are, that could potentially um, result in what I'm seeing? Um, so that's probably like the vaguest answer you've ever gotten in regards to it. Um, I would prefer to see a more variable foot, but I've also never forced anybody like somebody that's like the really extreme supinators. It's like to, to, to have that come back and, and suddenly become this beautifully adaptive foot. Um, you can change some stuff above the foot that influence it, but, but it's pretty rare that, that uh, you see somebody, somebody go from, something that that's been rigid for 22 years, you know, and then suddenly gets this great looking foot. Mm -hmm. So, so you can influence things to a certain degree. And then I think the rest becomes a management process. So you wouldn't, so if they have like a high arch, for example, I mean, usually it's often associated with gastroc tone excessively, right? Cause they're kind of stuck into that limited dorsiflexion position. Uh, would you do so? Would you do anything to address that, or would you just say, oh "Hey, oh yeah, like, God. sure." Like, you know, what like, would you do? If I, I, I don't know, uh, I don't know because I don't know what everything else measures, right? Okay. Yeah. I, again, I can't look at this in isolation first. I have to look yeah. at this globally, mm -hmm. and so, all right, can if if I change? Okay, so I'll give you. Let's see, what, who was in there the other day? Hang on a second. I can't think of his name. Um, there was a guy, a guy came in um, earlier this week and was limited in dorsiflexion on one side and was having like a, like a hard bony sensation in the front of his ankle. You, you've seen those guys, right? Yeah. Okay. And what we did is we inhibited the extension tone above the pelvis. Okay. Restored the variability of the pelvis and the sagittal plane and all of his dorsiflexion came back. Okay. So that's tone that's driven from position above, right? And so you have to eliminate that possibility. And then you have to look at the possibilities that, okay, you know, maybe it's, a, it's, it's the shape of his foot that actually does that, right? So maybe I have a subtalar joint that has three facets on it. Okay. So a three facet subtalar joint does not pronate like a single facet subtalar joint does, okay? The single facet subtalar joints are very mobile and the, the three facets are not. So I can't change that. So now it becomes a management process. But I don't know, I mean, unless you have like some sort of MRI that's gonna tell you that he's got a three facetter, you're not gonna know that. But right. you have to eliminate it progressively, right? Do everything that you can sort of above the foot, do everything you can with the foot, from whether if, if you're a manual guy and you want to do like soft tissue to the muscles that cross the ankle or the, the soft tissue to the, to the plantar aspect of the foot, or you do mobs or pops and prays or whatever you do, you know, you address it the way that, that, that your scope allows and what your experience allows. And then if anything is left on the table, that's a management process. And so maybe that's an orthotic or maybe that's a, a, a style of shoe or, you know, maybe you just take care of everything above and you kind of hope for the best. I, I can't give you like an absolute, right? Yeah. But, but it, it's a, everything is a process, mm -hmm. right? And, and the more, uh, 
you expand your generalized knowledge base, the more options you will have that potentially influence that. Because if you look at it just like, oh, he's got a rigid big toe, let's crank on his toe, bad idea, right? You don't want to go there first. That might be your last option before you say, okay, this is a management process, right? Or this is a referral, you know, to, to a doc, right? right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Thank you. Bill, can you elaborate on the, uh, the three facets of Taylor joint versus the single you said? Yeah. Yeah. It, which, which one's normal? There is no, there's no okay. such thing. Okay. Right? Um, in fact, I, I think there might be five different type. Don't quote me on this. Um, see you, Tony. See you, Tony. Um, I think there might even be five types. Don't quote me on that. Really? Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. So, um, I first learned about this actually in physical therapy school. How exciting is that? Yeah. So <laughs> one of my instructors, one of my instructors was Jan Bruckner and she's, she's one of the first people that, that used an MRI to identify the, the facets on the, the subtalar joint. Okay. Really, really early on when the first MRIs were coming up and, um, um, and she, she identified these rigid feet. So you, she actually created a test called the functional forefoot drop, which nobody uses. Um, but I, I'm still aware of, and, uh, I hope she's still alive. Actually, that'd be kind of cool. Um, but, uh, uh, what, what they found is, is like, we have these multiple facets. So it's, so it's where the, the talus rests on the calcaneus. Um, if there's a singular facet, there's, a, there's a, the, the movement is a lot more fluid across that joint there. But if I have three, so think about like, um, Oh, mobility in regards to a single contact of a stool. So if I had a stool with one leg that was dead center, how floppy the stool would be, right? It would tip over and, and have a lot of mobility, right? If I put a three prong stool in the ground, it doesn't roll at all. It doesn't move. Right? So that's what we're looking at. So the, the, the multifaceted, so Taylor joints are very, very rigid in regards to how much pronation and supination will be available. So depending on the angles of the facets and all that kind of stuff, the foot's going to rest in a certain position. So that's where you're going to have people that are supinators no matter what. And you're going to have people that um, have these broad scope of, of, of pronation to supination excursions um, because of the shape of the, of the facet joint, of the, of the sub -tail. And there's my dog. Hi, Paxton. Um, yeah. Okay. That that makes more sense. The uh, I mean, I love the stool thing. That and there's there's you you can search this. You can do a Google and, and you'll get pictures and you can actually see the differences in subtalar joints. I found a research article that I think talks about it, but I'm trying to listen to you and I can't read Is it. Jan Bruckner on the byline. No, it's from 2015. Mm. Her stuff was in the late seventies, early eighties. Wow. Yeah. I'll keep looking and I will. I mean, it doesn't uh, have to be hers. I'm just saying there, there is stuff out there that, that will express that. And I, I, I can't remember how many different kinds there are, but there are definitely multiple kinds. I'll try to uh, leave this in the comments in case anyone wants, or in the notes in case anyone wants to dive into it. Does anybody else have a question? Uh, I do have one question. So, Go ahead, Mitchell. So let's say, for example, you have an, a baseball player, a pitcher, who's very successful at what they do, let's say, uh, in their draft year in college, so they're a junior. Mm -hmm. But their throwing motion is a high risk. Like, it's not very clean. They have poor scapular upward rotation and – their arm drops low, putting their elbow in just like a bad position, but they're very successful at it. Mm -hmm. Would you address that movement pattern at all? Like, or how would you, if you would? Mm -hmm. there, so this is going to be a tight Terrell question, actually. So get that food out of your mouth, brother. <laughs> um, we talk about this stuff all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there are, so if, if you take a, any sporting, uh, task like a golf swing or a baseball throw or javelin or any kind of jump or whatever, there's going to be certain elements within that, that activity 
that that have to exist okay so you know the, the ability to load the 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 stabilizing hip and for for a pitcher so right-handed pitcher mm-hmm. when they're in single leg stance on their right leg it's like they have to be able to turn into that hip and then turn out of that hip so they can load it and then unload it right and so when we talk about like the arm position so what determines arm position for a pitcher it would be scapular positioning that's part of it right that's the other half of the shoulder joint right so the arm attaches to the scapula yeah and then you got 17 muscles that attach the scapula to the to the uh the torso right mm-hmm. have one joint that that basically attaches the entire upper extremity to the to the thorax so a lot of times when we see an aberrant what we can, might consider an aberrant arm motion Okay, it's the inability to position. Sorry. It's fun. It's the inability to position. <laughs> Honey, can you take him out? No, upstairs, out. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Um, yep. So, so what we have to be able to then do is position the, the thorax, right? Mm-hmm. Because that's where the scapula rests, right? It's the yeah. foundation of the scapula. And then underneath that, you've got the abdomen. Underneath that, you've got the pelvis, and then down to the extremities, and so on. So when we see an aberrant arm motion, there's no guarantee that it's like an arm motion problem, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure that we've got all the other components in place. And so again, it's like you've got this cascade of events that we have to look at. Okay. And so then you have to determine what your priority is. And sometimes you can spot it. I mean. I have to slow stuff like baseball down really, really fast. I mean, it's really, really fast. So I have to slow it down quite a bit to, to see some stuff. Mm-hmm. And, um, um, but a lot of times you can identify things from other components of the, of the pitching motion that should be there that maybe aren't. So like the inability to, to rotate out of that stabilizing hip or you watch their landing position and you see that they can't turn their, their pelvis um, into the front leg, so they don't they don't internally rotate their front hip. Well, how do I compensate around that for me to to attain any kind of velocity? And so maybe that's why you have this what you uh, uh, what appears to be an aberrant arm motion. And then you know there's some some uh, um, contralateral things that have to occur. So so when one side of the body is it, or one extremity is supinating, the other has to be pronating, and vice versa. And so sometimes you don't see that. But again, it all trickles back towards the uh, the remainder of, of the of the torso and then even extremity position, right? Mm-hmm. And so in those scenarios, if if the coaching side of things doesn't do it, so you give the right coaching cue and they still can't approach it, then maybe you've got something that's in the way. Okay. Right? And so now you're talking about okay, I need to select an activity that allows me to achieve the position that I want first then I have to progressively increase the complexity and the demands so that uh, capability is transferred into the activity um, in question, which in, in this case is pitching, right? Mm-hmm. What I do, Ty? Ty Tara? Um, no, it's very good. I think, I think the biggest challenge is, is determining whether or not um, – a change is going to be beneficial or detrimental to the, to the pitcher. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you take someone like, like a Strasburg who's often injured, but he has, <laughs> when he's not injured, when he is healthy, he's, he's elite, like top five arm elite. Yeah. Um, nobody's stuff moves like his stuff. Um, it just comes at a great price for him. I, that's a tough, that's a tough answer. I don't know if this is like, because the athlete's priorities also matter in this equation. And I'm not, I can't go to someone that has a two ERA and is 18 and two and, um, you know, but has elbow pain every once in a while, unless they, they really, really want to get rid of that elbow pain. And it means more to them than that two ERA and going 18 and two. Um, unfortunately in our, in our culture of sports, it is, um, widely accepted and and assumed we're going to have pain discomfort uh etc 
and yes, there is an inherent risk that comes with, with performing at a high level with high levels of stress and et cetera. Um, but there also is a management process that could potentially be in place that would um, uh, either impede that, that negative consequence from stress or uh, help overcome, uh, you know, in the, in the following days, hours, whatever. So my determining like factor is, can I improve their performance by making a change? Uh, and that's hard to determine. Um, and, and, and two, if I don't make the change, is there potentially going to be a negative consequence, consequence coming? Mm -hmm. Um, it's like Bill and I, we, I asked Bill a lot of questions about, you know, arm, shoulder, arm, elbow, et cetera. And, um, so if I have an arm, an orientation of like my humerus that, that negatively impacts my elbow and I'm throwing 94 miles an hour, I don't like that, you know, and, and I'm probably going to try to make that change. Mm -hmm. Um, if I have someone who lacks trunk rotation, I know that's going to negatively impact the way they load in their throw and then some other things as the domino effect of that. So I know that I might want to change that. And that might mean losing uh, some of the extension tone that has allowed you to throw the way you throw uh, up to this point. Um, for some reason, the, the relationship between force and velocity, because I was doing some of that today, uh, comes to mind. But you can increase force and decrease velocity and still increase your power. Um, so like, just because one goes down, it doesn't mean everything is going to go down. So like, I can, you know, I don't know, you know, take away a guy's, you know, uh, uh, you know, the way he throws and, and, and some of that extension, that doesn't mean he's going to lose power. He might actually gain a uh, better loading mechanism or strategy through, you know, sequential and segmental loading, not sequential, but segmental loading, and then hopefully segmental unloading, he actually might gain velocity and spin and, 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 and um, uh, you know, not succumb to fatigue so soon if I allow him, you know, you know, increase his ability to load his trunk. So I just asked my question, am I, is, there, is there a negative consequence coming? And then can I potentially increase his performance by making the, train, or the, the change? And because I asked those two questions, because that's really my, those are my only things that are my, my job falls in, but those are two things that mean something to that pitcher. Um, and everything else, like my opinion on how mechanics should be and things like that, don't matter that picture. Um, it's just in result. Um, now, does that become the decision become significantly more difficult if it's like a signing year for something? Like, would you just stay away from that until whatever happens? So, like, if a senior in high school is going to, is a high draft pick or a high prospect, mm -hmm. would you just kind of, Oh no! Would you? Uh... Uh, you know, I, I kind of know where you're going here. It's like, do, do, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't, kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it 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 kind of comes down to like, okay, what have they asked of me, like as my role in this? Um, and so I always look at it. I and you, you've probably heard me say this enough times in some way, shape, or form that all of this stuff is a management process, right? So what is, what is the smallest thing that I can do to have the biggest impact without negatively affecting the outcome, <laughs> you know? And, and honestly, that's what I try to determine, right? Because ultimately it has nothing to do, like their abilities to perform have nothing to do with us, right? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're already good. Right. I mean, we're talking about somebody that's already got skills. They've already got abilities. You know, our job is to assure that they are allowed to demonstrate those on a regular basis. And that, and that's even iffy as to whether we can contribute to that. Um, but uh, um, we always talk in, in our office about, about safe to fail experiments, right? So these are little things that you can do that may have, little impact or big impact or no impacts, but, but they're small. So they're safe to do. So we don't put people at high risk. We don't try to make massive changes all at once. Um, because you just don't know what the outcome will be. You've heard of the butterfly effect, right? So yeah. butterfly pops its wings in whatever country they talk about when they talk about this. And then there's a tidal wave somewhere else. I don't want that tidal wave to happen unless it's something really, really good. So 
and I don't know when that's going to happen. So you always try to make these the smallest possible change that doesn't negatively affect the outcome, right? So maybe it's, you know, uh, again, a subtle coaching cue. Maybe it becomes, you know, pressure management through the, through the rib cage, right? So you give them some sort of activity that allows them to move the pressures around a little bit differently. And maybe that's enough, right? To sort of solve your problem, mm-hmm. but you just don't know what the outcome's going to be. So to, to, to say yes, to say no. Okay. You know, yeah. and, 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 but I want you to feel at ease with the fact that we all feel the same way like you do right now, you're going like, okay, that doesn't really help me. What do I do? It's like, I don't know. Um, Do something, do something small that you think will help, but won't have, like if if it does fail, doesn't have this major consequence associated with it. Yeah. Right. And then you say, did that work? Then you ask the question, did what I do help? And if it's a yes, then you say, I'm going to do a little bit more of that. And if it doesn't work, then you don't do it. Right. I mean, and, and again, we're back to, to some trial and error and we're back to the scientific process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. One of the bros has a question. We got Ty. Ty, I want to hear what you got to say. No, it's nothing like profound. Just to Mitchell, to your last point, like you can frame, like I've got a kid that's pretty dumb. And, uh, and so when I talk about, uh, some things to him, I don't always frame it in a way that is true. Uh, I'm not saying I'm lying to him. I just, I frame it in a way that it makes him more comfortable. So let's say you got a high school senior, you got a college junior, whatever, that's getting eligible for the draft or whatever. Like if it is a high school kid or college kid that's going to get drafted, get them drafted you don't want to put any seed in their head that, that, that may, you know, make them lose confidence or doubt or whatever. Like, you know, when they perform, they need to, they need to, you know, be confident about everything they're doing. But I mean, after they get signed, you've got five to six years or whatever the life of a, you know, minor league contract is um, to make all kinds of, that's a, that's a long process. So this dumb kid I have, we're in his fifth year. I'm in my fifth year working with him. And um, it's an endearing term. And, uh, and, you know, Bill has been a big part of this too, but we have figured out his body a little bit more every year. We've added to his performance a little bit more every year. Um, he's getting closer to a finished product, at least as far as we can do. And so I just, if it's someone that's young, I wouldn't be in a hurry. I just, if you're going to make, I don't know, I, I just would frame anything that you're going to do with them. Like, Hey, listen, this is going to help your shoulder recover. Uh, but really, maybe you're trying to add, you know, train the subscap or whatever, and, and or you're trying to add, like, decreased pectone. I don't know. Whatever you want to you just say, just frame it in a way that's going to uh, make them really comfortable with what you're doing. Got it. Yeah, I think that's very helpful. Good. Lance, yeah, one more. Okay, one more. He said it. Bros over at the gym. What do you no. got? I have a question. See, I really... Go for it. Ivy. Who's this? Corey. Who's, who's asking the question? Corey, Ivy League. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. So, athletes in games, fast paced environment, things are moving quickly. They have to make decisions, predictions, whatever they have to do. Yeah. Uh, and like recreating an in-game situation are there ways like within our realm as coaches we can help them with that make those decisions or predictions on the fly and they can't really don't have time to think if that makes sense so, so you you want to know if you can duplicate those concepts in in some other environment like like the training yeah. environment to like make decisions predictions other than exactly recreating a game like situation not without exactly recreating a game like situation the last phase the last phase of a sports training program is the sport right mm-hmm. it, it it's not impossible to to reproduce the 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 forces and the and the energy demands it's not impossible but it's it is very difficult to to duplicate um and it's also diff- difficult to duplicate the emotional component 
and the cognitive component, right? And so again, so everything falls short unless they're playing the sport. There are certain, like, like when you look at like um, short-sighted games and, and um, um, futsal for soccer players and stuff like that, there are elements of that that do help but it's not, it's not the same. And so rather than trying to simulate something that may transfer, why not just have them play? Um, because you can't duplicate it. it. We just, I mean, we just can't. So, um, you know, we can do recognition drills and things like that, but, but the cues are different. The visual cues are different. The auditory cues are different. My, my, perception of space is different so you know if i'm on a if if i'm just doing like a you know you do like a four on four or something like that for for soccer players you know there's a conditioning element there's a strategy element there's a tactical element that may provide elements of transfer but it's not the same and so at some point in time you know you've got got to uh you've got to put them in the, in the actual situation so you do get uh, proper preparation, right? Because um, again, it's like put them on the, the normal size pitch, and then you know I've got more distance to cover. I have to orient myself in space. Um, I have to put them in a game-like situation so they experience the the psychological demands that that are, are normally you know imposed. That's why they have preseason for professional sports, right? Because it, it's like, why are they even playing these? These games don't matter because the last phase of any sports training program is to actually play the sport. They have to be ready because again, it's so hard to duplicate. It's not impossible, but it's exceptionally difficult. I think the, the landing force um, for an NBA player on one leg is something like six to eight times body weight. Do you really want to put them in six to eight times body weight forces in the middle of your training facility and put them at that high risk? I mean, seriously, it's like, that's, you know, and, and we're probably approaching it, you know, at times, but, but really, is it, is it worth the, the, the risk to do that? And, and I don't think so, but just play the sport, which is what they need to do anyway. And they're always going to do that, right? In a properly structured program where we talked about the, the vertically integrated components of a, of a training program. Well, maybe number five is actually playing your sport, right? So maybe they're playing some pickup games or, or some structured games, you know, uh, in low volume um, early on in their, their off season. And then as they get closer and closer, then it becomes the game. Right. So like there's no mechanisms, I guess we can give them cognitively to help them, maybe not physically, but I guess to deal with sort of maybe emotions or something that's going on that in a game that's they maybe can't deal with. Say the last part again, bud. So, like, if you have a player who's super emotional and that affects his performance, so there are mechanisms mm -hmm. you can give them that help them cope with that. And you think you can make somebody that emotional that, that equates to a game scenario? Or help them deal with their emotions better, I guess? Well, maybe, but maybe that's, maybe that's just having to talk with the right person, too, right? It's like teaching them how to manage that. But that's, that's probably beyond our scope, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, once you have the, the facial freshness talk and you, you look at Ty Terrell and you say, oh, Ty only got four hours of sleep last night, right? Um, you know, and uh, you've done all your pre-measures that you would do for your, for your training uh, uh, component. It's like maybe that's not our talk. Maybe that's the sports psychologist or maybe that's a tactical issue that, that needs to be addressed with, with the sports coaching staff and that that's not our deal. And I'm not saying that there's things that we can talk about that can be helpful. But again, it's like to, to, come, to try to uh, duplicate that, that degree of, of emotion and cognition, I don't think that that's our, our place at all. I think that's more of a tactical, psychological thing. Okay. That definitely helps. Yeah. It's, uh, there's, there's so much in sport that we can't duplicate from a, from a training perspective. Um, and we have, we have to accept that fact. And, and I think people keep trying to do it with all these cute little like visual things. And it's like, okay, I mean, that's a visual skill certainly, but it's a skill within itself. And that there's no guarantee that, that me looking and chasing lights has anything to do with anything on a basketball court or a soccer pitch. Mm -hmm. What did you just say, Ty? Playing love songs by One Direction. 
<laughs> Enhances emotion. I like it. All right. Uh, Think outside the box. Bill, any parting words? Good night, everybody. Thank you all for showing up. Good questions, Great. guys. It was fun. That was different. Yeah, I like this. Peace Come out. back next time. Next month, we're planning it. See you. See you. Uh, you guys can't tell, but I'm pointing to your different faces. <laughs> <laughs> so weird. <laughs> Out there. All righty. Peace out.